Hi there, and welcome to show number 51 of Experience This. Uh, Bruce Rosard, I'm one of the co-founders of Arrival and a co-host of this podcast show with Lori and Christian. Uh, Lori Timoney, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey, everyone. Lori Timoney here from Go City. Happy to be speaking with Justin today. Looking forward to the conversation. I'm Christian Watts with Magpie Travel. I apologize, I can barely speak today. Um, I think I've missed like two or three. I think you guys recorded two or three without telling me, so I'm not sure what happened there, <laughs> but definitely missed a couple. So happy to be back and delighted to be here today with our special guest, Justin Buzzy from Get Up and Go Kayaking. Yeah, thanks Justin. so much for having me, guys. Um, I'm Justin, CEO and founder of Get Up and Go Kayaking. Um, clear kayak tour franchise business. I started back in 2016 and, and started franchising in 2018. And um, we have 32 locations now. So obviously it's been a, a bit of a journey over the, the last eight years, but really excited to, to be here and chatting with you guys as well. So thanks for having me. So Justin, to kick it off, I mean, that's just incredible progress um, in a short amount of time. And you know, we know each other quite well. You come to, you've been coming to Arrival for years now. Um, and, you know, you're just in that inner circle of friends of people that talk about growth all the time. I think we have you as a speaker to talk about scale and growth mm -hmm. at many of the Arrival events. Like, what do you, how do you grow so fast? Like, what do you, what do you mm. credit it towards? Yeah, there, there's a lot of things. I mean, it, it, it takes a lot of, doing things, doing a lot of things right. Um, it started with social media. That was the the reason and kind of the, the gasoline that got thrown on the fire back in 2017. Um, we started going viral uh, back then. This is, this is the time when like, you couldn't really go viral on your own page yourself unless you had millions of followers or whatever. You had to go viral, you know, in being on someone else's page. So, um, insider reached out and and uh, asked to share some of our videos that they had seen on our profile. And of course, we were like, yes, please, please share them. And within like two days of those being shared, they had 5 million views. And then BuzzFeed also shared the videos and then Yahoo shared them and then Travel and Leisure shared them. And like, it just was like this big domino effect that happened really fast. Um, and I started the company with two locations, which I still own. And at the time, it was only those two locations, no booking software. Um, I built the website. I was just doing Google Calendar bookings and like taking payment after the tour happens, not even before the tour. And um, so we, we went viral and then everyone was asking like, hey, do you guys do the clear kayaks in this location or over here or over here? And my answer was no, I only do it at these two. And but then the next thought is like, but how do I do it at all of those locations, you know, and that's really when franchising kind of came up. Um, I, I never really was building this to turn it into a franchise. I thought I was going to be the tour guide the rest of my life, you know, and, and be happy with that. I was cool with it. I was having a good time. Uh, and, and so it was really just a need from like the amount of exposure that we had in a short amount of time to expand. And then over time, it's been like, how do we keep growing that exposure? And thankfully, like social media is in a great place now where you can go viral on your own pages and you don't have to rely on, you know, these third party outlets. And so we've just continually leaned into that. And, and over the years, we continually go viral. Like it feels like every month, you know, last year we had over 250 million views organically on our pages. This year, we're already over 250 million views organically on our pages. So in the last two years alone, we've had half a billion views. So that I, I would say that's one of the main things that like we've done really well to help with the growth. But there's obviously like so many more things that that come with it. Yeah, and we'll get into some of those uh, for sure. I just want to ask one more question about kind of your founding story and then uh, hand over to Lori, who has some questions for sure. Um, I know that you had a different career going before you started Get Up and Go Kayaking. And yep. then it, once I heard about it, I was like, oh, this is that's not who I thought you were. So <laughs> tell us tell us about your golf, your golf life. Yeah, so I, I've had a couple different careers before uh, before kayaking. And I'll start when I was 13 is when I first uh, started rapping, actually. 
and I was a rapper for 11, 12 years. I really kind of stopped that when I started Get Up and Go Kayaking back when I was like 24, Can we hear 25. Just like a, a, one, one, <laughs> uh, maybe you could go on YouTube. You could go on YouTube. There's still some stuff there in, in Spotify. I meant but, live, Justin. Yeah, I know. I know. But, <laughs> you know, I haven't warmed up the vocal cords today. Um, I don't know. So, um, but yeah, so I did that for a while. Right. And I was actually pursuing that as like a career. Like I, I wanted to do that full time. Um, I was doing shows every month. I was putting out records. I was doing a lot of different things. I, I even got commissioned by the university of Wisconsin to do their, uh, their, their college anthem, um, back in like 2019. So like I spent some time up in Wisconsin and they like flew me out and did some stuff up there. It was really cool. Um, so I did that for a while, which taught me a lot of random skills that like I get to still use today. I think one of the big ones is like networking and being able to kind of read the room and, and fit in with, with the room that I'm in, uh, it, in the rap world, it's always like these really random, weird situations and rooms and scenarios that you're, you're in, whether it's studios or you know, at venues or whatever. And I've got a really good understanding of like, I think how to navigate that um, and network in that in that scenario. And then, so I grad I went to UCF, the University of Central Florida, graduated with my marketing degree. I was working at a golf course in high school and then also uh, in college. And as I finished college, I was like, okay, I need a, an actual career now. And so I used my golf um, background to, uh, to, to leverage kind of one of the connections I had made and, and found myself working at the golf channel specifically for golf now, which is like the tea time distributor, uh, online and started there as like a customer service rep. But as I was there for three years, I had four different promotions and my, my last role there was a pricing analyst. So I was literally just in charge of uh, 6,000 golf courses in the United States and Canada and their pricing. So I get to still like lean into that world a little bit and really think about pricing and dynamic pricing and like all of these things in, in kayaking world now. And so it's cool. I, I got to take from corporate world a little bit in that sense and apply that to my business. I got to take from the entrepreneurial world of like trying to be a rapper for a long time and, and implement that into the business. So it's been like a couple weird things that have all kind of happened before just randomly kind of coming across the opportunity to start a kayaking business one day because I realized there was a lot of demand for it here in Florida. That's so cool. I, I you know, one of the things that um, as I was looking at uh, some of your stuff, Seems to me that one of the reasons you grow so much is uh, is just, it seems like you're just grabbing opportunity everywhere and you're asking all kinds of questions, getting super creative. I love the idea that you started with the idea of a clear kayak because what better way, right, to showcase, you know, the beauty of the area and just, yeah. so right out of the gate in terms of just even developing content, it's like, bam, you've got this opportunity that a lot of these tour companies might not necessarily have. So great idea to start with. And yeah, um, I'd love to just talk a little bit about content because it seems to me like you're just incredibly good at creating content. You're obviously putting out a lot of content and you're using that to build kind of a community. I know you've got like several different um, you know, social channels so I'd be interested to know what your sort of strategy is in terms of how much content do you put out, who's doing it, um, and and where where are you focusing on putting the content? Yeah, yeah, it's changed quite a bit over the years, and we kind of we we try our best to follow where the customer attention is as as, as much as we can, um, and a lot of that comes from just learning on you know listening to different podcasts, talking to different people, and understanding just the internet and culture and, and where that attention is. But across the board, so just to paint a, a better picture of it all, each one of the franchisees has their own social media stuff. So the good thing is, is like we have 32 different locations that are hopefully putting out content on a daily basis. And then from my level as kind of the franchisor, corporate 
you know, level, we get to consolidate all of that. And we have so much ongoing content that like, we're, we're not going to run out if we post 50 times a day, we wouldn't run out of content. You know, we also really lean into like, trying to get our guests to take photos and take videos while they're out there. So, so our guests are also, you know, doing the user generated content stuff for us too. And like, I'm not having to go out and actually film any content. It's all just coming in from franchisees and from guests of ours. Um, but really we, I mean, we focus on all of the main platforms, right? So it's, it's Instagram, Facebook, YouTube shorts has been a phenomenal platform for us in the last, I would say year and a half. Um, TikTok, LinkedIn, Twitter, Pinterest, it, those are where we spend all of our time. Um, and typically, I mean, we create one piece of content and we just use it across, you know, all seven of those platforms or however many there are. But last year we put out um, somewhere north of like 4,200 pieces of content in one year wow. uh, across the company. So, you know, in terms of daily content, that's over 10 pieces of content a day. Uh, but again, that's 30 locations, like all doing that from my, from my level. Um, I have a community manager that puts out content every day and compiles content and reworks it based on what's trending and stuff like that. And, um, I've tasked her with putting out at least three pieces of content on every platform every day. So we've been on that cadence for about two years now. And, um, I mean, you guys could tell from the views I said earlier, like it's definitely working. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be paying someone to do that as a full-time job if it wasn't working, you know? But the yeah, no, question cool. has been, sorry, Lori. Um, no, 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 go ahead. It, is how do you track that to conversion? Uh, and there's definitely some people like yourself, and I think even you posted a while ago, you know, literally like a year or two ago, that despite all the traffic, is it leading to bookings? Um, a, do you really know? And B, is it? Um, and is it changing where the channels are starting to get closer to the booking so they see a piece of, someone can see a piece of content and at least get to your website? Um, yeah. Then it's up to your website to convert them. But it seemed it seems like a lot of people that do what you do are still questioning the conversion aspect. Yeah, yeah, it's very tough. Like it's not easy to track that. I think the the couple low hanging fruit ways of doing that are having the, how did you hear about us option in the booking flow? Right. And it, it tracking that on an individual basis is really difficult, but over time you can track the trend of it from a, from a high level. And I feel like that gives me a really good gauge of, is this working, you know, year over year, let me, let me take a look at this and see if there's any big drops or increases or anything like that. Um, our, our social media is the number two thing. How did you hear about us for our business behind uh, internet search, which I kind of loop in Google and, and any other, you know, searches on the internet. Um, so for us, you know, when I track it year over year, it, it is, it's always in that similar spot for us. And it usually equates to about 20 ish, 25 ish percent of our business from that. How did you hear about us? Which is usually, like last year, that was like $1.3 million worth of revenue. So it's worth it for us to be spending that much time and effort on it for $1.3 million worth of revenue. Um, it may not be as worth it for someone that's, you know, only, you know, if it's bringing in 20% of 80,000 bucks, it might not be worth it for that, that type of person to be spending as much time and effort as we are on it. Um, but I do think like if you start understanding what works, what doesn't work and get better at it, it's going to help your business. And I think it helps in ways that like, we won't really ever be able to track, you know, someone saw a post of mine a year ago, and then books a tour next year, because they just remembered seeing a clear kayak in Orlando near the theme parks, two years prior, right? Like, how do you track that? There's no possible way to do that. They just had a memory in their head of like, Oh, I remember when I saw a video online, like, let me look that up now. And then they click on a Google ad, right. And then you're attributing that to the Google ad conversion. And, and really it was a social media conversion to me, you know, so there's no way to track it to your point. Um, a hundred percent accurately, unless we like get these booking softwares mm -hmm. to like, you know, allow some sort of linkage to 
the social media outlets, but I think we're far away from that. So there's no great way to track it, unfortunately. And, and people find us in all parts of the customer journey too, through social media, right? Like the dreaming phase, the discovery phase, the, the planning phase, like it's really, you don't know which phase they're in when they're actually first seeing you on social media too, which is tough. Yeah. How do you get the usage? People... Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Christian. I didn't know you were going <laughs> to. I thought, I With thought that I'll do, voice, I'll do one, one, one question. I think yeah. we want please, him to at least please. ask a question or two and we'll, we'll <laughs> grin and bear it. Absolutely. <laughs> no, I, no the, the attribution is the key and, and that's, a lot of people use that as a reason to not do social media because it doesn't work because I can't track it. Therefore, it's a waste of time. But I think that's an excuse. And also that, yeah, the part you just mentioned, it's in the dreaming phase. Therefore, it doesn't convert. Therefore, don't do it. But I think that's pretty silly with the amount of eyes that you've got. But let me ask you this. If you were removed tomorrow morning and you now own a walking tour company in Rome, one of 50, would you go after social media as aggressively because you're 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 now advertising rome as a destination which is fantastic clearly but yeah. today you've got a very distinctive product and you're probably maybe a monopoly in some places whereas as soon as i land in rome i've i've kind of forgotten the name of your company i yeah. came to rome because i saw you on social but i've forgotten you as a brand so would yeah. you still do that for others yeah, of course. Um, <clears throat> look, if I owned a concrete business, I would still do it, right? Like it doesn't need to be a pretty business to to do social media and do it well. I would do it differently than than how I do it now. Um, you know, I think on a on a history based tour, like you want to make things fun and, and interesting and exciting. And I would I would go in and try to create some cool things throughout the tour that are maybe these fun viral style videos of the tour guide doing something or saying something or having some sort of interaction or i think it would be more um more talking based and less uh visual dependent on the the environment you know well i guess rome is still very visual too um but even even if we took a walking tour in like minnesota where it may not be as visual as rome right i would lean into the personal side of of the tour guides, the, the the owner of the business, if it was me, I would make videos, I would talk about current events, I would do green screen videos, I would do remix videos, I would, there's so many things that you can and should be doing that I think people just don't do, I, you know, and, and to your point, it's likely because it's very hard to track. Um, but, you know, we all know that TikTok, it, if you fly to San Diego is a great example, when I was at arrival in San Diego, and I opened TikTok, like the whole next four days that I was at Arrival, I saw so many like California based content creators and like people that were in San Diego, like it shows you things in the market that you're in, it knows where your phone is and it'll show you local things. So if you're not doing it, you're just missing out on that opportunity of being able to even show up when someone is in market, uh, especially on a, on a platform like TikTok that does that location based um, serving of, of the content. So. Yes, I would, whatever business I was in, even if it wasn't in the tourism world, like social media is the freest attention you can possibly get nowadays. And 500 million views for free for me in the last two years. How do you, how do you compete with that? You know? Yeah, absolutely. So um, YouTube, you, you, I think you said you're having unbelievable success there. And it's kind of amazing that not enough businesses use youtube it's really really interesting um yep. so what would you say like in terms of what percentage of the business that you're getting overall have you been able to track to youtube so out of the 20 percent that we get from social media i think youtube's still very small on that um again it's it, this is hard to track when you try to get super granular with it but i would say out of that 20 percent, youtube makes up maybe 10 percent out of all of that but it's growing. I think that's the mm -hmm. important piece for me is that it used to be like 1% of that, right? And like now it's 10%. So that's the interesting thing in my head where I'm like, why is that and what's happening and, and how do we expand on that more? And so we've been leaning into it more and trying to figure it out more. And it's one of those things that's like YouTube shorts right now is, is there's a lot of um, demand and not enough supply, you know, not enough people are putting content out on YouTube shorts. So your videos get served more often and um, it's easier to reach new people that way. 
the audience segment on you on YouTube Shorts is a little weird. It's it's not as um, refined as TikTok's algorithm or Instagram's algorithm. So like I'll go in and look at the analytics and realize that like a lot of it is actually males. Where on TikTok and Instagram, a lot of our uh, interactions are from females. So the the person that it's getting served to is a little different on YouTube, which is why I think the conversion may be a little bit lower than it is for our Instagram and, and TikTok stuff. But again, it's growing over time. So that's the interesting piece to me. And I think in the last week we've had like, or, or sorry, the last 28 days, I, I looked yesterday, we had 13 million views on YouTube. And uh, we just we just got monetized literally like six days ago for uh, for our YouTube channel. And in the last six days, we've made like 180 bucks on YouTube just from having videos on the internet. And it's like, this has now become another revenue stream another for revenue us. Stream. You know, wow, it's, that's, it, that's interesting. And, wow. and we've been posting three shorts a day since October 22nd, uh, 2022. So this was like right after I think arrival two years ago, I was like, okay, we need to go hard on, on content stuff. And, um, we've really been going hard for for two full years on youtube shorts for it to really start paying off yeah would you say then justin that you know there's the creator economy it's one of the economies out there right now right that we could all speak about um are you part of the creator economy you know because in a lot of ways you are you're not do you call yourself an influencer <laughs> um yeah, I don't know what I don't know what economy is based around. I don't know what word to call it. I don't think I would I would call myself an influencer. Um, I think I would call myself a creator for sure, a content creator. Um, I love the content piece of things. I think that's something I took from the music world also. Like thinking about how you roll out an album is very similar to thinking about how you roll out a new location or a new product or something, right? Like there's some some similarities that that were kind of cool from my past that I've been able to, to lean into. But yeah, I would say like, it's, it's, it's only going to become more and more important for creators and specifically becoming a creator if you're the owner of a business, I think is really, really an interesting piece that like not nearly as many people in our industry do as other industries. Um, everyone seems to shy away from wanting to be on camera or wanting to, build a build a personal brand they're all everyone's focused on building their company brand but like no one's focused on building their personal brands right now i would say you guys are probably actually leaders of it because you have a podcast and because you're putting out content and because you're doing those things um and that and and you guys will consistently rise to the top just because of this one thing and and i think to me that's crazy that more people aren't doing stuff like this in our industry and creating in, in turning themselves into creators because it's just a huge missed opportunity if you're not doing it. So in DC next year, for example, you should lead a session about why an operator should be a content creator. Like we've never done. Definitely. Um, yeah. Instead yeah. of yeah. finding influencers, which we've yeah. talked yeah. about. Yeah, and there's, and there's there's so many easy things to do. Like, it, I think people think it's like this huge task to become a content creator. And and I have seen the most simple content creators go crazy. Like, um, uh, what's the guy that does the food stuff on Instagram, uh, or sorry, on TikTok? I forget his name right now. I'll have to circle back on it. But he literally only does food reviews in his car. Like he gets the food, he goes into his car, he eats the food, and he's just talking to the camera as he's eating the food. <laughs> and um, and and he's actually, turn I believe this could be really cool for Arrival, but I believe he's turning this whole creation that he's done into some sort of food tour, which is, it's and it's going, it's going to be really, really big. It's, it's going to be really interesting. But um, he goes to businesses, refu uh, reviews their food in his car, and has millions and millions of followers, millions and millions of subscribers, makes millions and millions of dollars probably from all of this. Like, and it, his name is Keith Lee. So he calls it the Keith Lee effect, or people call it the Keith Lee effect. And if he goes to your restaurant or food truck and rates you a pretty high rating, your business will change for the entirety of the rest of your business. And 
it's very simple what he does. He's literally just sitting in his car eating food and telling you yeah, how it is. That's amazing. And what's so cool about that is that it's not like he had to like apply for a job. He just yeah. decided, okay, I'm going to become this food critic and here's how I'm going to do it. Isn't that, and, and I don't insane. even think he, I don't even think he was planning on becoming the food critic. I think he was just having fun and like reviewing a couple food places at the beginning and people started liking it. Um, but that's, it's simple. And I think people like overcomplicate with a lot of things in our business, right? I think people overcomplicate it and you need to figure out how to simplify as many things in this industry as you can to be, um, to really grow essentially to, to scale your business. You have to simplify a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, Christian, did you have anything you, I wanted to change topics. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to learn a little bit more about how you retain customers. So I know you've got, it sounds to me like you've got a bit of a loyalty thing going on there with the stamps, I think, or the stickers. Yep. But I also, um, I mean, you just launched a new app. So clearly you've got some, you know, some some ideas around how you're going to get your customers uh, or retain your customers by way of any number of things you can do by, by the app. Yep. Um, but yeah, I think just kind of like, you know, talk a little bit about that, the CRM, and then even the communities that you're building, which obviously helps to retain customers. Yeah, yeah, I think like, I, there's two things in the business world I love, which is really fun for me for these types of things. Like one is customer attention, and the other is customer journey. And so uh, we've talked a lot about customer attention, but this is kind of like going into the customer journey part of it for me, which is exciting. And we, I had a, I had a Zoom call with uh, Damon John from Shark Tank, um, like four months ago, and he said something that stood out to me quite a bit, which was, uh, it, it's 25 times more expensive to obtain new customers than it is to just retain or upsell your current customers. So, why are we spending so much time and effort, like constantly trying to get new customers? You know, mm -hmm. and I. I it made me really think and I was like, shoot, we spend so much more time trying to do that than just trying to retain or upsell or whatever, it, whatever that may look like. But so I think the one big thing that that my business specifically was missing is from from a CRM standpoint, um, communicating with our customers and being able to retain them, our booking software ended the, the transaction, the customer journey with just one follow-up email and one very short text that you're allowed to send out as well that they can't even text back to, mind you. So it's like this very, yeah. here's your dead end. Uh, if you want anything to happen after this, good luck. You know, it's on you to try it after that. So, you know, we had, a, we had an email service and we would have to export our customers and then like import them into our email service and then like manually send out an email. And it's like this frictional thing that takes time and effort. And uh, it's very just hard to track and stay on top of over time, honestly, it's tough. So I'm like, we, we really need a CRM. I think that's one of the biggest things that a lot of the booking softwares are missing is, is some sort yeah. of CRM component where you can actually communicate with your customer on a much level, much uh, higher level basis and, and more frequent. And I mean, think about when you purchase something from a big, uh, a big brand, like I'll use Adidas as an example. I purchased a lot of stuff from Adidas. They send me probably like two emails a day, every single day, yeah. right? And you guys are probably familiar with brands that do that for you. And they don't, it doesn't work every day, but it works once in a while where I'm like, okay, open the email. Oh, wow. I actually like how that new shoe looks. Let me buy that new shoe. Right. So why don't we do this at, at all in our industry? I think is, is the question mark there. And how do we get better at that? And so building a CRM for me was the answer to that question how do we rely on the 360,000 customers that we've already had come do our business to then come back out and do our business instead of have to get a new 360,000 customers, right? So the app is really just a, a CRM that also funnels any external communication to one place, just to the app. Instead of us needing to go into our Instagram to respond to DMs or into our Facebook messages to respond to messages or um 
it, if someone calls in instead of us needing to go to our third party phone system, right? Or if someone texts in instead of us needing to go to the third party phone app, like it, we can now do this all in one place. So to that theme of like making things simple, let's make it simple and get everything coming into one place. And then let's also set up like 50, 50 automations for the future where every customer's getting a holiday email on every single holiday. Customers are getting birthday emails and birthday texts on their birthdays. In the past, because we had one follow-up email in our booking software, we jammed that follow-up email with like, leave us a review. Here's our merchandise. Mm -hmm. We have a loyalty program. Have you checked out our other locations? Here's a discount code to come back. Like you have to put so much in there because you only get one shot to, to sell them on coming back out. But with the CRM, now we have six different emails, one email just for the review, one text just for the review. And by the way, if they reply to that text, we actually get the response, which is nice, you know, that the booking software didn't, didn't have the functionality. Uh, one email for the loyalty program, one email for merchandise, one e like, so they're getting a series of email <clears throat> over time now and not just getting everything all at once right after the tour. And so I, I just feel like that's a big missing piece um, for a lot of people, including my business literally until this past month uh, where we've been able to finalize that and build that out that we've been missing out on. It's just trying to retain the customers. And we how do you have... get them to sign up for the app though, Justin? Like why do they have to use the app? So th they're not signing up for the app. It's just an internal app. It's just for us that mm. automates everything okay. internally <laughs> and sets up these uh, workflows that sends out automated communications I to see. the customer over time. The customer is just using their normal like texting phone right. number and, and email. You, okay. you built this system yourselves? Yeah, so with the help of um, Dustin from Conversion Assist, he actually helped me piece a lot of this together. Um, so I owe him a big thanks and I've thanked him quite a few times, but um, he, he was a big help on all of this. But I wanted to create a solution that was kind of like custom for our business and not necessarily a out of the box solution from a third party. There's a few third parties in the industry that do this exact thing, right? And Conversion Assist is one of them. Like you could do this exact thing through that, but I wanted to make it a little bit more custom. I wanted to turn it into an app that was branded for us on our phones. And uh, it also like adds to our IP. You know, if I ever try to sell the business, I now have an, a customized app that app that comes along with the business and and really automates a whole lot of the the post tour customer journey stuff. Well, I was wondering, is this something you could bring to market? I could, yeah, yeah. And like <laughs> through the process, I've been thinking like, oh man, I could just repackage and resell this thing to to so many different people. I know but an event that you could come to and, and do that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that sounds uh, really, really interesting. And the fact that you built it, well, not you didn't build it yourself, but you had a partner, a tech partner yeah. to build it to your spec. Yep, um, yep. And it's needed. And, and like the added expense for me is only like an extra 25 cents per customer to do, to do a lot of automations, you know? So like, it's very inexpensive to, to get all of these extra things to happen, which is to me incredible. And to not have to export customer lists and then import them somewhere else and then send them and then build a manual email and so on and so forth. We can just- It is integrated with your booking technology, right? Cor correct. We get a booking that customer automatically gets put in as a contact into our Go app. Um, right. So we don't have to do anything to get them you in there. Yeah. There's an and... API between the booking tech that you use and- Correct. Yeah. I don't know why I don't know why nobody's built this marketing as a service. You know, it's such an obvious. I we had discussions a few years ago yes. about it, but no one's actually brought it to market. L L L Laurie, how, how are you guys at this um, CRM stuff? I mean, for a lot of operations, you don't get repeat business. So that's a reason not to do it. Like for us, we're out here in California, we get people once in a lifetime, a lot of them. But you guys have got obviously. How many cities have you got? Do you do you market between cities? So if I go to London, am I going to get an email? To go and visit London, to go and visit New I York mean, next time. I mean, you generally get more of an overall Go City email. It's it's our emails are fairly general. Um, I mean, we do sometimes uh, market to specific destinations, but um, I would say that uh, in general, most of the e emails that go out, and most of it is email marketing. Um, but of course, we have our social channels channels as well. Um, we're not putting out as much content as Justin is. That's for sure. 
Um, but, uh, you know, we're definitely, I think the, the opportunities are, or I should say they're just, it's, there's more content going out the door now than there used to be. And, but we don't have, um, I mean, we, we can probably, I would say one of our goals would be to get a little bit better at customer retention for sure. And I think in the activity space, that's always been a challenge is how do you retain customers? You know, it's not like hotels.com, you know? Um, yeah. But I love, so I think actually, like from my own point of view, I love this community idea that you have because I feel like, you know, people feel like they're part of something, then they have much more of a desire to continue to, you know, engage with you. And exactly. so having that opportunity seems pretty I didn't, smart. I didn't really hear community. I heard retention. Um, what, yeah, I'll, community? I'll touch on that piece more. Um, so a couple things. One, we have a texting community, which... Um, we have a, a centralized phone number that all of our um, customers can text or interact with, or we can interact with them. So a good example was maybe a, maybe like two months ago on a random Wednesday, I said, "Hey, Justin here, founder of Get Up and Go, wanted to hope, uh, wanted to just send you a quick message, hoping that you're having a great week. Um, happy Wednesday." And that was it. I sent a text out to like seventy five thousand people. It cost me 750 bucks to do that or whatever, the one cent per send. Um, you would be surprised. I I got over 100 replies saying, oh, my God, thanks so much. This was a, a, a you, you just brightened my week or my day or whatever, right? Like that, I think, builds a brand, which which builds loyalty, which builds retention and, and so on. So. We have a texting community and then we also have a, a private like Facebook group community where we try to funnel our customers into after they've done a tour with us. Hey, you know, we send them an email out. Hey, please join our Facebook community. We want to continue having fun with you guys adventuring and following along with your adventures as you adventure anywhere else or, or with us again. Um, and so we try to uh, go in there and, and post, um, open-ended questions and get conversations going and maybe restaurant suggestions or maybe like other adventure suggestions or just seeing people's photos of their travels or adventures or whatever. So we have a couple like, um, a couple different communities, I guess you would say that all kind of funnel back uh, into get up and go kayaking and, and just building the brand. But um, I do think it's really important to not just make the customer feel like a transaction, you know, and unfortunately that's how most of the booking softwares and companies are just set up because of maybe the booking software or the way that the business is ran. Like it feels very transactional. So how do we make, how do we make people feel more welcomed and wanted rather than just a thanks for the money. We'll see you again sometime in the future. I mean, you do have a big advantage that you have over 30 locations. So there can be a lot of, okay, I went Correct. to this one. Now you can sell me on these. And a lot of the companies in our industry have one, you know, some of them have two or three, but. Not Correct. But maybe have... they have, maybe they have multiple products, right? Or, or maybe yes. they are considering upselling things or considering a gift card to come back out at a future date. Like it doesn't need to be multi-location to do what I'm doing. It can be yeah. singular location, even referral. single yeah. product. I friends. mean, yeah. Yeah, you know, like tell someone about us. Yeah. That's it. Like it's as simple as that. Yeah, I think it's kind of like a combination of old school because you're trying to take care of the customer. You're trying to have a little bit of a personal relationship with them to some degree. But at the same time, you're also utilizing, you know, uh, current methodologies to get your, you know, get your product sold and, and get it in front of people. So it's, it's kind of it's whatever you're doing, it seems like it's working. Does the CRM Thanks. change when the booking comes through a third party, you know, through an OTA or what have you? Um, yes. Yeah, so this is really cool. Um, we've, we've set up a few automations for that example. We'll use Viator as a good example here so people can compare their own processes. But booking comes through Viator. We use Fair Harbor as our booking software. And that that is automatically put into Fair Harbor through the API between Viator and Fair Harbor. When that booking happens in on the Fair Harbor side of things, it triggers a customer inside of our CRM. So 
So it adds that person as a customer inside our CRM. But then one step further, the good thing is from, from Viator, we get the customer's phone number. We don't get their email, right? So we text we automatically text every customer that books through Viator and ask them for their direct email in case we need to communicate about the tour. Automatically, we don't have to do anything. When they send us back their email, it automatically repopulates in their contact in our CRM as their actual email. So now we have their customer profile built out with their exact phone number, their exact email and their name. So now I've got all the customer information that I, that I want and need that Viator didn't want to give me from the beginning, right? Mm. Um, so now I can market to them directly in the future and retain them a little bit better than I could have in the past, which is great. Um, so there's steps like that that I think like people are missing out on and you can't really email target or email market any of the customers that you're getting from Viator right now because they usually just give you that long email address at Viator.com or TripAdv whatever whatever that email is, but yep. um, not only that, but then at the end, after the customer has done a tour with us, we have an automation that puts them in a lookalike audience on our Facebook advertising that just continuously builds that lookalike audience larger and larger to every new customer that comes out with us. So now our lookalike audience is, is very, like Facebook really understands what a good customer looks like for us. And auto, we don't have to do anything. It's just automatically set up to send them from our CRM to our Facebook ads account into our lookalike audience, which is pretty neat. To add one other piece to that, it's a booking for six people and Viator only pushes the booker to you. Yep. And I know you must have a solution for those <laughs> other five people to put in your CRM. And that would be? Waivers. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Every every guest is required to sign yeah. a waiver. Whether whether your company does this or not, you should set up a requirement for waivers. You should have waivers, even if it's not required by your legal, your your insurance, whatever. Like just set up a fake waiver if 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 it's not required. But get the customer information that way. So when one person, even if this happens in in direct bookings too, like one person books for eight people, how do you get all eight of their contacts, not just the one person? Yeah you use a waiver and make every single person sign the waiver. When they sign the waiver, every single customer gets put into the CRM and then the same flows happen and the same things happen. Um, but I also think like not enough people really look at that information enough inside their waivers that they should. Age, uh, age is super important. You know, Do you know what your exact target audience is, who your previous customers have come out, where the biggest range of them occurs, I think is super important. And you can do that through waivers. Um, zip code, if you can get everyone's zip code when they fill out their waiver, you can then export all zip codes, put it into chat GPT, say, hey, give me my top 10 booked zip codes and how far those zip codes are from my location. And it will now tell you your most frequently booked zip codes and how long of a drive people are willing to make to get to your location. So now I can build a radius around said location based on knowing that most people only are willing to drive 45 minutes to said location. Why would I want to build out a radius that's further than that 45 minute drive? You know, so there's a lot of things that you can do with the current information that people probably have that I feel like we're, most people overlook. I feel like the waiver thing is a big thing. Um, I was working with this uh, company and, you know, in my head, I was thinking, oh, I got to make this super simple and I don't want to have to, you know, make a bunch of work for all these people. So I'm just going to have one waiver. But now that you talk about that, I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah, of course, you should have one person. But the waiver probably has to be pretty simple. I think sometimes if the waivers are too complicated, people are like, oh, my God, I can't, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But but um, yeah, that's a good piece of advice. So yeah. getting getting everyone to fill out that well, waiver. Well, it's post-transaction, is... right, Lori? So, you know, you already have yeah. the, the booking. Yeah, and, that's, the, and there's the, a few companies that specialize in that, you know, as mm -hmm. well as the booking systems. Have yeah, so the booking Someone... systems, all of them most ha have some kind of a built in waiver situation, but yep. they don't all require you to have one waiver per person. Sometimes it's like a one waiver per group thing. And that's, yeah, that's I think that's operator. what I'm getting at. Yeah. Is, yeah. yeah. And that's where that's where well, it gets tough for some of the bigger like boat operators or the big bus tour operators like 
they're trying to get 200 people quickly onto their vessel. And if all 200 have to yeah, take three minutes to sign work. a waiver, right? Like that's where it becomes a little difficult for me. Our group size is 10 people. So like we can get all 10 of them to sign the waiver before we get on the, on the water. Very simple. Yeah. Um, but that's where more thought goes into the customer journey. And how do you get people to sign that before they even get to the location? I think is the, is the real winning piece there. If you can get them to do it before they even arrive, then it's, they can just come and enjoy the ride, you know. Can a hop on, hop off bus company do that, Christian? Yeah, if we did it before they arrive, I mean, yeah, on location, there's there's zero chance. But if you give <laughs> a reason to do it before, yeah, yeah. That's funny though, when you think about <laughs> it, like having people fill out a waiver to get on your bus. I mean, I right. Know. Yeah. It, and it may not be a waiver, right? Like you don't have to call it that. Like let's call yeah, it something right. else. Let's call it like a pre-ride confirmation or something like. Hey, we just need a little bit more information to confirm that you're coming on the bus with us or something. Or can like we that. use your pictures in our social media, you know, accounts or yeah. whatever? I, I think smart yeah, two for one. Yeah. off operators could figure out a way to a yeah aggregate What's data the angle? from all their So clients. your your zip codes, right. Justin. I'm I'm anxious to know what percentage of your customers are like based in the immediate area or within let's say like a hundred miles versus travelers yeah you know it's um typically when i do that exercise it's just per location i haven't done it across the entire company at once it's too much info for gpt to spit back to me um but usually what happens is the majority of customers are coming from within that one hour ish window of the location but then the pr the problem is, is like, I do it based on frequency. So I want to see the most booked zip codes and the rest of the world is so large that like, there's a huge segment of people that are coming internationally and are coming from the rest of the country. It just happens that they, there's not as many frequent from that exact zip code. So it doesn't like pull into the top of that list. But if you aggregate all of them together and loop them all in as like an international zip codes, like it's yeah. a big poor, it's like 50% of it, you know? So it, it's tough because it doesn't allow me to pinpoint where exactly internationally they're all typically coming from. You can hire Christian to do the AI <laughs> part and he can get, get it all taken care of for you. Yep. Yeah. You, you know how you do that? Excel. Sometimes <laughs> yeah. Excel is better than, better than AI. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. But I mean, we only have a few more minutes. Uh, yeah. No, I was just, I was just, the only reason I was kind of getting at that is because I, um, you know, you obviously have a lot more opportunity to really connect with these people and potentially build like something with them, right? If they're more, if they're closer to you versus maybe just True. coming once or twice, you know, um, have you ever given any thought to developing kind of like a, a club where somebody can just like have a kayak and pull it out and go and like couple hours here or there, or is it always have you gotten to that place or would yeah. you ever think of that? Yeah, I've, I've definitely thought about it. We we specifically only do tours, so it makes it a little bit difficult, I think, to mm. do something like that, you know, unless we're saying like, we'll reserve you a spot on the tour or something. Um, and I've thought about how does that look for, for our top customers? Would they be willing to pay a membership fee to yeah. be able to come out whenever? Um, it, it, that's, that's difficult. I, and it's something I still want to spend a little bit more time on, but the bigger piece to me is knowing who my top customers are and giving them rewards as they come and visit more locations. And maybe I'll just do it that way. You know, like, let me encourage them to come and tour with us more so that they unlock rewards. And that's kind of ties into our loyalty sticker program. As they go to every location, they get a sticker as they get more stickers, they unlock rewards. So I kind of feel like that's almost doing the same thing as what you're saying, just in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think there's probably a world where, yeah, that some sort of membership or club could could be a really smart opportunity. It's tough in the in the tour space. I think it would be much easier if we had like a, a rental fleet that. Yeah, yeah, you'd have to have rentals yeah. too. Yeah. So what if I'm a VIP? You identified me as a VIP and I don't mind spending more money. What would you do for a VIP? Yeah, so every, um, typically like every third like, so after you do three tours, six tours, nine tours, we try to do different um, giveaways and things to our customers that have done that many tours with us. And so like, we'll do free merch after you've done three tours with us. We'll do uh, a free tour after you've done six tours with us. 
and then we'll do a year of half off tours after you've done nine or 10 tours with us. Um, and we, we only have two people that have reached that status. So I don't know what the next level is going to be beyond that, but I'm, I'm thinking some really VIP type of, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll fly them to close to where I am and bring them out to dinner and give them a day of something, you know, and, mm -hmm. and figure that, that out. But cool. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I want to give back to them as much as I can. And, um, I think one thing too, that I wanted to quickly mention is, is we, uh, we finally built a mascot, which I think I've been talking about for like a year and we haven't put it out yet, but, uh, it's cool because I can now use those kind of top customers as a test group of like, we have two different names in mind for the mascot. And now I can just email that top group of customers and be like, what would you guys name this mascot? And it, I think that alone makes them feel like they're more a part of the company, you know? Is it a manatee and a kayak? It's not. It's not. I think most people <laughs> expected it to be a manatee or an alligator. And um, we, we, we didn't go that route because it was too expected. Do you want to have a, a group of three to give you some feedback right now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll launch it when it we're ready. Next, <laughs> next, next week or two, actually, we'll probably launch it. But I'm we, excited. We haven't gone on enough I'm excited. tours yet to <laughs> earn that right. <laughs> You're not the top loyalty customer yet, Bruce. Come on. Right. Yeah, yeah. Come on now. Yeah. All right. Well, we're pretty much out of time. That was awesome. Um, I know I learned a lot and yeah, I, I think there's a lot to go from here and I actually have some ideas and thoughts about cool. what you might be doing in DC at arrival next year. <laughs> uh, count me in, count, you know, I'm down for whatever. So I, I'm stoked. And I have some and thoughts on getting into a clear kayak, which I've yet to do. I've not ever done a clear kayak. Let's go. We'd, lo we'd love to awesome. have you. We'd love All to right. have you. And I'm excited. DC is going to be sweet. I'm, I'm stoked that arrivals going to DC and I haven't been there since I was a kid, so I'm I'm excited to uh, to go to a new place for a ride. Can you kayak sure. on the? Uh, I'm Potomac. sure we could figure something Potomac out. Potomac River, so because yeah, we we're could, actually uh, in yeah. Inner Harbor, and we need cool. to go across the river to DC. <laughs> Maybe we could have a fleet of kayaks there. Although I'm not sure we would see much in a clear. Yeah, right. Bottom. Or maybe um, what we see, Bruce, we don't want to see. Want to see. <laughs> <laughs> would you rather know or not know what's below you? Right, I guess exactly. is the question. <laughs> All right. Well, Justin, thanks a lot for joining. It was awesome. Thank you, Lori and Christian. Uh, Christian, you know, you go to so many conferences. That's why you lost your voice. So I know. Possibly. But <laughs> hopefully you'll get that back for our next few. We have some really interesting guests coming up over the next month. Uh, and we'll see when we actually get them out because uh, we record and then we publish when we can. So <laughs> thanks, Justin. And we will yeah, see you. Thank you, you guys. All right. Soon. All right. Thanks, Thanks guys. See you guys. Thanks a lot. Yeah.